My name is Katie Maloney, and I'm Senior Director of UCSF Alumni Relations, and we're so excited to bring you this conversation between our author and her interview, Dr. Nancy Doyle. Before turning the virtual podium over to um, Dr. Doyle, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items to help you with your experience. To submit a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A box. Please keep your questions brief, and given the size of our audience and the number of questions, our speakers may not be able to answer everything, but we'll work to uh, address uh, a lot of your questions. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Nancy Doyle, a UCSF alum and classmate of Dr. Detweiler, and we hope you enjoyed the, the conversation this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Doyle, and I'm looking forward to uh, what you all shared with us today. Thank you, Katie, very much. And thank you everybody for um, tuning in to watch this wonderful interview with the Susan who's just done such an amazing job. And I'm happy to know that this is recorded because a lot of people are actually working and can't be free at noon. So tell your friends and people who missed out, it's being recorded. So uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Susan, my dear friend, the author of this book, The Women Physician Pioneers of the 60s. Susan and I actually met unofficially uh, through Nancy Drew. When we were children, we read Nancy Drew. She was like our hero. She was independent. She was investigative. She was thorough. And that was our role model way early on. And we didn't know that till we actually met officially during orientation at medical school. But at that time, we really connected very early on because we both loved being there. And we're so grateful and thankful to be there and knew how lucky we were, really. And we grew up, both of us, wanting to be doctors, and but we didn't really know that would be possible. So what we did when we went to college, we just took all the pre-med courses. We never signed in with a counselor, pre-med. We never went in the track program. We just did it on our own. All those courses, you know, physics, chemistry, you name it, whatever. And uh, we had so much discouraging dialogue from, not from everyone, but lots of people. And sort of independently, we both came to a moment when we decided, you know, why not? Let's go for it. And we did. And we got into medical school. And again, so grateful. So Susan was born in Los Angeles, but moved to San Francisco when she was four. And then she went on uh, to attend Wellesley College in Boston and then returned to UCSF in San Francisco. Uh, she became a well-known uh, surgical pathologist working in Seattle and also a teacher of many generations, well, years of residence in pathology. Um, during that time, she also got a fine arts um, degree in a major of fine arts, sorry, uh, in writing and then continued with her work. So her story is amazing. And so Susan, Please tell us, why did you write this book? How did this happen? Uh, thank you, Nancy, uh, for introducing me. And I also want to thank you uh, for your encouragement. I think we first started, I first told you about this project during our 40th reunion um, mm -hmm. back in 2011. Yep. And we even met with uh, Dr. Lillian Cartwright uh, at that time uh, to try to uh, enlist her enthusiasm in continuing the project. Um, if you could show the first side. Uh, so thank you, Nancy. Uh, this is us as we uh, invest started this investigation. Um, I also want to thank uh, Lily, Dr. Lillian Cartwright in the next slide. Uh, who initiated this project uh, and uh, for her willingness after shepherding the project for 25 years uh, to work with me in bringing it to a 50 year uh, finale. Uh, that, uh, Lillian came out of uh, basically out of retirement to help with this. And uh, I'm totally indebted to her, not only for doing the project for 25 years in the first place, but for also uh, her subsequent help. Dr. Paul Wink, uh, who's a psychologist, um, 
that worked with her on the 1990 uh, portion of the study uh, also helped a great deal in the early phases of contacting uh, the graduates um, for the 50 year follow up. Uh, and I also am indebted to the uh, alumni department at UCSF and to the uh, UC uh, Medical Humanities Press for publishing the book. Um, <clears throat> I thought I should probably give a brief overview. Uh, we can take the slides off now, thank you. Uh, she gave a brief overview of what the study was, uh, the initial study was. Uh, when we entered medical school uh, in 1967, part of our initiation package uh, contained a request to all the women in our in the class that um, we entered, uh, asking us if we would participate in a study that Dr. Cartwright was uh, conducting as part of her PhD work at the Institute of Personality Assessment and Research at Berkeley. She had previously asked the three classes before us of women. So the classes entering in 1964 to 1967 formed the cohort that she studied. There in total were 58 women uh, in that co cohort. Uh, she uh, asked us to fill out innumerable personality questionnaires, sort of the standard personality tests at the time, plus uh, others that the Institute uh, had uh, specifically designed. The Institute, um, just as background, had studied professionals for a long time. And in fact, they had studied physicians at UCSF for a long time. Uh, but they only studied the men. Lillian thought studying the females would be a good topic for her dissertation. And that's how we came to be of interest. Uh, I think the Institute considered female physicians an arcane subject at the time. And Lillian was interested in arcane subjects. So uh, everything came under uh, way and we, uh, not only filled out the personality tests that she gave us, but we also had an extensive in-person interview with her. And Lillian is an engaging uh, interviewer. She was a very nice lady. I felt rather complimented that she was even interested in me. And I think others also felt the same way. Uh, so time went on and Lillian received her PhD, and she actually wrote quite a few papers on us uh, from that initial uh, interaction as we were just beginning medical school. So uh, time went on, we finished medical school, uh, we entered our internships and residencies, and 10 years uh, passed, Lillian did the whole thing again. We again filled out extensive questionnaires. Lillian got uh, funding from the Robert Woods, Robert Woods Johnson Foundation uh, to fly around the country and give uh, ex have an extensive in-person interview with us again. Um, then 15 years went by. By and large, we all got jobs. We started life. Uh, by this time, we were uh, between ages 40 and 50, we were at what she considered to be the, the sort of midpoint or peak of our careers. She again obtained funding from the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, and she did it all again. We filled out many tests. She flew around the country, interviewed us, and she really became the expert in the United States on female physicians. Uh, and that um, she was on uh, television programs. Actually, at that by then, women were no longer an arcane subject, and female physicians no longer were considered arcane individuals. Um, she was on many television programs. She really became the world's expert. A study like this had never been done, where a single cohort of women at a single time had been followed 
very carefully uh, and from the point of view of personality assessment with a great deal of data uh, for 25 years. Uh, one thing Lillian did do was whenever she wrote a paper on us or a chapter in a book, and there were quite a few of them, she would send us all copies of them. So in a way she stayed in touch with us even after the 25 year uh, time three study was completed. Uh, and I know Nancy and I in particular stay, stayed in touch with her. So that's the um, basis for the study uh, that forms the foundation uh, of the book. When I uh, started to think about extending um, the project to be 50 years was somewhat around our uh, 2011 reunion. Um, by then I had finished an MFA program, a master's in fine arts and writing, in which I took two years out of my professional life to do. And I um, wrote um, a number of essays. You sort of dredge through your life for something interesting to write as part of the program. And I found that um, my memories of medical school um, were not only still vivid uh, in my recollection, uh, but were um, provided interesting things to write about. And the thought of continuing uh, this, this project for 50 years took hold of me then. Uh, in order to do it, um, I then um, enlisted Lillian's help, as I mentioned, and Dr. Paul Wink's help. And we sent questionnaires to everyone that we could find uh, and had over an 85% or so participation of the women who were still alive and able to participate in the 50 year follow up. Uh, I then flew around the country uh, and did a personal interview with all the women in my class who were still alive. Unfortunately, we had had three deaths by then, uh, but everybody else agreed to a personal videotaped interview uh, with me. And um, then uh, I did my best to put it together and um, write a book about us. Um, and that will uh, be, I think, the basis for our talk today. So, so you, Nancy. I remember when we talked about this at the reunion and I was like, well, that's an interesting idea. And, uh, but then you did it. And what was the re so what was the reason or what were the main points of why you thought it was important um, to talk about our, our meaning all of us women physicians, our experiences? What was that starting one point? Uh, well, th th the world had changed since we started. One thing that I thought was important um, was that when we entered medical school, we did not bond as women. Uh, I th um, I think you know we were very the the uh, initial fourteen um, women of us were just one of the boys. Um, I think that was sort of our self concept as well as uh, how we were treated. In fact, I remember being treated very well by my male uh, colleagues in medical school and by the faculty. Uh, it's it was almost um, a military sort of experience to go through. We were on a conveyor belt in which the faculty was dedicated uh, to taking us um, to all the various stops to become a physician, uh, taking us from lectures to labs to clinical years. Uh, and the fact that we uh, were a different gender from the majority of the students, we composed 10% of the class, uh, really was not of interest uh, or importance to anyone. Um, so um, I, I would really want to emphasize that as far as medical school is concerned, uh, we were treated like everybody else. Uh, 
Uh, we were alphabetized, uh, for example, for anything which required a sub subgrouping of us. Um, freshman year, when we did uh, our dissection of our cadavers, uh, we were alphabetized. So uh, Nancy was put with the, the C and Ds, and uh, I was put with um, uh, the letter of my last name, too, as uh, cadaver partners. Now, I'm not saying that, that a few incidents didn't occur. They, of course, occurred. Uh, we were a diverse group of people. Uh, in fact, one um, uh, cadaver-related incident uh, occurred to one of our female classmates, Shumary Chow. Uh, Shumary shared a female cadaver with three of our male classmates, and everything was going well. And one day when she came to the lab, uh, she pulled uh, back the sheet on the female cadaver uh, as her three male colleagues kind of held back behind her. Uh, and as she pulled back the sheet, she found that a penis had been added to the cadaver. And uh, not missing a beat, Shu Mary turned to about her by then giggling cadaver mates or fellow cadaver uh, dissectors and asked if anybody had lost something from the night before and proceeded on with the dissection that we was that we were doing that day. Uh, 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 actually, uh, you know, in some respects, um, that kind of male medical student humor uh, was nothing new. Lucy Wanzer, who was the first female medical student at UCSF entering in 1873, had the exact same experience when she was doing a cadaver on a, fe a dissection on a female cadaver. Uh, but those incidents really, I don't think, bothered anybody. It just sort of added humor to the whole situation. The the so as far as medical concern, medical school is concerned, I think um, it was a very harmonious um, sort of gender neutral experience. The the disparities um, in how we were treated really came more when we went when we were finished with our our internship or residency programs and tried to find a job. Then we did face difficulties as a female. Uh, Bonnie Vestal, for example, who was in our class of graduating class of 71, uh, worked for almost um, two thirds of a year for free uh, in her area of pediatric oncology in Boise, Idaho, uh, before she could, uh, before the, the insta the uh, Mountain State Tumor Institute would actually even hire her as a female. Uh, and when they did hire her, it was at an extremely low salary. I think it was about 16,000 per year. Uh, Nancy um, accepted that. Number one, she was um, quite relieved to finally have be hired uh, at any salary. Um, but also, um, she negotiated some modicum of free time uh, to uh, have because by then she had two children. So there was quite a bit of negotiation that I think many women had to undergo in order to not only get a job, but to also have just some small degree of flexibility. I remember you, Nancy, telling me about when you first uh, came to Santa Rosa. And Nancy, by the way, was the first female pediatrician in Santa Rosa, if I'm recalling correctly. The first, but close to, maybe the okay. second. <laughs> okay, oh, very early. Um, and um, uh, my recollection is that you, in order to have, um, very little night call, you negotiated a salary of $20 per hour 
as an initial salary, but that $20 per hour extended for more than a decade before finally uh, a, a more equitable salary came about. So there were difficulties. I remember when I tried to find a first job, uh, my husband, my then husband and I uh, looked through Oregon and Washington and he was offered a job at every stop as a uh, neurologist. I was, most of the pathologists wouldn't even meet with me, let alone consider hiring me. Uh, one pathologist in Everett said he would hire me, but he wouldn't pay me. Um, finally, the University of Washington needed a pathologist and I became uh, a member of the medical school staff at that point. Uh, but it, it was difficult to break into medicine as a female in the 1970s. Uh, there were, um, uh, despite the difficulties of breaking into medicine, I think many of us um, did hit uh, significant milestone markers uh, as we began our professions. Um, in fact, the first milestone marker uh, occurred back when we were in medical school um, during our senior year, just before graduation. Um, the uh, Gold-Headed Cane Society was a longstanding tradition at UCSF and at most of the medical schools in the United States, as well as in uh, England, where it first began. And the Gold-Headed Cane Society um, was, uh, uh, or membership into the Gold-Headed Cane Society uh, was uh, choosing uh, th uh, th three medical students from the graduating class um, who best exemplified, who best exemplified the uh, attributes uh, of the uh, best physician from that group. It was uh, the decision was made in uh, by the uh, fellow medical students of the class and by the faculty together, and uh, they were to come up with uh, three uh, individuals who exemplified uh, this sort of highest attributes of becoming a physician. Our class made history. Not only were the three individuals who were selected in, in uh, jointly, I want to emphasize by faculty and fellow medical students from that class were females. The entire slate was females. But then uh, in addition, one person was selected to actually receive the gold-headed cane. And in our class, Nancy became the recipient of the gold-headed cane. And this is Nancy with her gold-headed cane. She and Bonnie Vestal and Marie Felton from our class were the three winners of that. And very deservedly so. Uh, I rem Nancy, when she received the cane, did say that in her brief remarks that she was accepting it on behalf of our entire class, that she felt that we as a class exemplified the best qualities of an American physician. Um, but it was a milestone not only for UCSF, but it was a milestone for all medical schools in the United States and I believe all medical schools in England also, that we have the first female gold-headed cane winner in our class. So that was probably our first milestone. Uh, there we can uh, go back to the main screen. Um, but I think uh, through all of our careers, many milestones were hit. I know Shumary Chow became the first medical director of a major uh, Aetna uh, Insurance Company. Uh, uh, I was the first female physician at the 60-year-old Virginia Mason Medical Center. Uh, uh, there were um, uh, 
I, I think probably almost every single one of us hit one milestone or another. So, so, do, so that's kind of um, the seventies or so and things in our class, but there were some difficult times in society at that time, political, social, it affected all of us, men and women. Um, and some of them are really tough. So in the sixties, you know, the war was going on. And for me, a moment that still uh, sits with me is a few days into medical school, I was cornered in an elevator by several of my male classmates uh, and saying that my father was a murderer. Now, my father is a Pearl Harbor and Midway survivor, chief master sergeant of the, you know, military and, and a great man. And so that was very hard for me to hear that. And you can please elaborate others. I mean, we had, you know, a lot of the war affected all of us. But there were other issues going on too. So, can you address that uh, at the time? <laughs> yes, Nancy. Thank you. And, and uh, when I look back from this fifty-year standpoint, um, my um, conclusion is that we really occupied an inflection point uh, for women. In, in general, and certainly for female physicians. Um, we were before, before the feminist movement even began. I think Betty Friedan, Friedan had written her book, but no one had really read it. Um, and there was uh, certainly no affirmative action whatsoever uh, in medical school or probably uh, in many any schools at all. There was a great deal of civil unrest in the country uh, with riots going on in Los Angeles and other places. Um, in San Francisco, I remember the hippie movement was in full sway uh, with uh, uh, very uh, with drugs, uh, free love. I think The Graduate had been a film, a movie that affected impressed a lot of people that coming to San Francisco was just the right thing to do uh, to sort of uh, drop out and reinvent yourself. Uh, so it it was a um, a, a difficult time uh, for the United States. Uh, one of the real inflection points, I think, uh, that occurred. That's not to say that there weren't other inflection points we're probably at one right now in terms of the history of the United States. Um, uh, but it's certainly one that affected many of us. Um, the uh, draft uh, was in full sway because of the Vietnam War. Uh, and although uh, doctors uh, were handled differently uh, by the draft, uh, the um, uh, the Berry Plan, uh, which was uh, still in effect uh, when we graduated in 1971, and uh, so and um, in the subsequent uh, years, as the men in our class uh, went through internship and residency, mandated that you had two choices: you could either join the military. Uh, as a medical student uh, and then sign up to uh, with either uh, one of the mil branches of the military or another government uh, program like the NIH or the Indian Health Service um, and that you would then uh, uh, go into uh, the military or one of these alternate services upon uh, finishing some portion of your training either just after internship, or you could uh, also negotiate extending uh, your more specialized uh, training. Uh, this was um, something started during the Korean War in order to provide the military with trained doctors who had a variety of levels of training, rather than uh, drafting doctors just straight out of medical school. Um, 
This, uh, the Berry Plan applied only to men, as did the draft in general. Uh, but it, it it did affect the women in the class. It, it affected us because of boyfriends or husbands uh, who had to go into the military. Uh, most, many of us spent a great deal of time during medical school marching against the war. I remember going up to the top of Millbury Union where uh, together, even with, with some faculty members, we would make signs protesting the war. Then we would march down Fell Street to the um, city hall uh, to march around and uh, say what we thought of the war. Um, um, although the draft didn't pertain to the women, we it it did affect the planning uh, for those of us who uh, were involved with a, a male who had to go in uh, in planning the future uh, because the draft the doc doctors were drafted for two years and usually the first year you were sent to Vietnam. Uh, so the time was a, a time, I think, of great unrest throughout the country, and it did specifically affect doctors in a special way, and certainly it, it, it altered uh, the experience of medical school. Well... It is said, I'm not sure who said it, but it takes about 50 years or half a century to have perspective. Uh, I'm looking back at what has happened in history or a time. So you had that overview, you've had those 50 years. So what do you think is the most interesting points out of that? Um, when I conceived of this book, after I had done the interviews uh, with many of our, our classmates, as well as women from other classes, um, it began, uh, I began to see us more in the sort of the arc of history, um, almost really the arc of almost the world history and where we fit. Um, in the interviews, I learned the backstory of many of our classmates. And these backstories were, were um, parts of our lives that Lillian had not uncovered in her interviews. Um, if uh, you could put on the first uh, slide, please. Um, we were all born during World War II basically. We were all war babies, uh, born sometime between about 1940 and 1946. So we were not boomers. Um, and we certainly were not part of the greatest generation. But we were born to families who had experienced the Depression and then experienced World War II. And this slide that I have up now is from our classmate, um, Marie Felton who was one of the uh, most popular uh, students in our class and um, was a generous, free-spirited, happy uh, individual who always had um, on a long flowing skirt, uh, uh, necklaces, uh, flowers often in her long curly hair. Uh, she was just the embodiment of a free spirit and hippie. And it wasn't until I went and um, learned more about Marie's life that I really began to understand what she, what had composed her life. Um, one of the tragedies or the tragedy uh, of Marie's life is that she died early. She died when she was approximately 50 in uh, 1993, I believe. Um, of a glioblastoma. Uh, but I had long interviews with her widowed husband and her brother, who, of course, both of whom knew Marie well. Marie was born 
in Southern France uh, as her parents were chased by the Gestapo. Her parents were Eastern European Jews who went to France to, to go to university because and anti-Semitism in Hungary and Poland where they had grown up uh, was such that they were not allowed to have university education there. So they both went to France. And when the Nazis invaded France in 1940, her parents got on their bicycles and pedaled to Southern France where they uh, more or less hid uh, successfully for about three years until someone betrayed them. And they uh, then had to take uh, on foot to the force and try to just hide as best they could in, uh, in Southern France. Marie's mother was pregnant during this time. And when she was about seven months pregnant, luckily, she was, they came upon a convent in Southern France where the nuns took her in and where Marie was born. I'm pretty certain from knowing from what the times were like in that part of Southern France, um, as Germany, as the news tightened around Germany and the Gestapo um, were hot on the tail of anybody that they thought was escaping, that they would not have survived. Uh, but thank goodness for this, um, the kind nuns, Nancy uh, or Marie uh, was born and survived with her mother. And ultimately her father also was able to come out of hiding. Um, after this, uh, they spent about five years in refugee camps in France before they were allowed to immigrate to Canada. So when we knew Nancy, we knew her as this uh, woman, a uh, medical student from Montreal, who had a very generous free spirit. She, um, her family stayed very closely knit. They always, her father always was afraid uh, that it would happen again. They never talked about their Jewish Jewishness. They never talked about their experience in the Holocaust, um, although both families um, that stayed in Europe uh, perished during the Holocaust. And it wasn't until uh, Nancy or be, until Marie uh, uh, had a child that she uh, felt that the family would continue that she um, really began to re-embrace her Judaism. Uh, uh, throughout her career, which she did in Boston, um, she uh, devoted her time to the disabled uh, and the elderly, to frail elderly people and people who uh, were struggling to remain independent despite the handicaps that, that beset them. She uh, founded multiple healthcare uh, 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 organizations in order to have a home healthcare service to these this disadvantaged uh, population. And uh, in fact, her, her husband, who was similarly uh, oriented, uh, continued this after Marie died. Uh, so the whole Holocaust history uh, didn't come out until much later. In the next slide, another one of our classmates is Helene Olson. I never exchanged a word with Helene uh, over the four years that we were in medical school together. Helene was a quiet, withdrawn individual who really interacted practically with no one. Uh, uh, and uh, when I interviewed uh, Helene and really got to know her for the first time in this 50-year uh, follow-up, I heard her backstory. Her parents were German uh, uh, Jews who escaped to London uh, in the uh, mid uh, to somewhat late uh, 30s, where Helene was born in 1942. Uh, 
and they eventually uh, came uh, to the United States. And again, their entire families perished in the Holocaust, uh, but they survived. Uh, in contrast to Marie's parents who were warm and loving, Helene's parents came out of this experience bitter and angry. And Helene grew up in this uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, an atmosphere of uh, without any warmth or affection. She became totally independent when she was 18 and, and uh, started at Berkeley uh, for college. She had to pay her entire way through college and she did menial jobs uh, to afford to do that. And it, that happened also in medical school. In addition to attending medical school, she worked in fast food restaurants and other things um, to uh, uh, pay her way. And it, uh, but yet in her career, uh, she did manage to find a fulfilling way to practice medicine and a fulfilling life. Uh, by a series of sort of almost accidental uh, happen happenstance, she uh, joined a, or first went to work for a group of evangelical white Christian male surgeons who had um, spent part of their time as missionaries. Um, she was the first woman uh, to uh, join this group, first female uh, physician to join this group. And she did the internal medicine initially. Um, later, as the group um, uh, hired and, and uh, fully trained internist, uh, Helene did, then did pediatrics. And she finally settled in on doing all the OB. Um, the um, poor uh, immigrant laborers uh, were uh, a group that she paid uh, special attention to. Um, and she actually uh, became the go-to obstetrician uh, for the unemployed and, and the immigrant um, uh, farm workers in that part of Michigan uh, near Burien Springs. Uh, and she ultimately uh, found a place where she felt comfortable and could um, practice medicine as she, as she uh, thought it should be practiced in a very hands-on, interactive way with her patients. She actually even converted uh, to Christianity and became an evangelical Christian herself. Um, uh, out of this um, uh, whole experience uh, of her background, uh, she totally changed uh, not only her way of living, but her whole uh, religion and outlook on life. The next um, slide is another example uh, of the, in part, world history that the women in uh, this cohort of 58 women uh, experience. Uh, this is uh, uh, Tomio, uh, she eventually became uh, Tomio uh, Hooper after she married, but Tomio Inanami uh, when she started medical school. Uh, Tomio was born in an internment camp. In fact, she was born in the most notorious of the internment camps, the Thule uh, Lake uh, Relocation Center in Northern California. In this cohort, cohort of 58 women from the four classes in medical school, four women were Japanese ancestry. All four of them were basically born in internment camps. And when I interviewed, I interviewed three of the four women um, and they all recounted that really the most formative experience of their life was coming from a family that had undergone that internment. Um, one uh, mother uh, said, this is for Joyce Yano, uh, her mother said, never make waves. Remember, this is a white man's world. Uh, you look different. 
uh, never call attention to yourself and never um, make waves uh, because you basically don't belong to this society. Well, Tomio is a great example. It, well, all four of the, the women of Japanese ancestries ultimately did very, very well within the medical profession. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, Tomio because not only did she um, remember her years in the internment camp, the compound uh, with uh, high concrete walls topped with barbed wires, uh, with guard towers uh, and guards with uh, machine guns at every corner. Uh, but she ultimately uh, uh, worked and became a professor at the uh, uniformed uh, services uh, health, the uniform uh, university of healthcare, uh, which is the medical school uh, that belongs to the military, and where she uh, participated in many studies on the health care of service people, where she worked for well over 25 years and ended up as a full professor. So working on the health of uh, uh, American uh, service personnel. Um, the next slide uh, is of uh, Shu Mary Chow, who was in our class. Shu Mary was born in Northern China in 1942. Her grandfather was one of the major warlords in, in Northern China who uh, lost power as the con uh, during the communist uh, takeover. Um, prior to the uh, communist uh, 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 takeover of China though, uh, her father who was a physician went to the United States uh, to do his residency, leaving uh, Shu Mary and her mother behind in China. Well, the fact that she, uh, she, her father, her grandfather was a warlord, certainly did not endear the family to the uh, communist leadership of China. Uh, so they uh, first moved to Beijing, but because of their background, Shu Mary could not go to school in China. They eventually got out to Hong Kong, where after about five years, they finally were able to gain admittance uh, to the United States to join the, their father. Uh, and Shu Mary um, uh, then was uh, basically uh, raised in Los Angeles and joined our class. Uh, and so that whole background of uh, going from place to place in China, uh, really followed Shu Mary throughout her professional life, where she probably had the um, highest number of uh, being first of any of us in our class. She was the first medical director of Aetna Insurance. She was very um, the first uh, uh, physician to take part in Impact, with which. which uh, was the pharmacy benefit management company that uh, now dominates the market. Uh, but Shumary had a very successful uh, career. Um, the last slide I want to show of people with unusual backgrounds that tie us to, I think, world history is Faith Fitzgerald, who became one of the preeminent medical uh, teachers, certainly on the West Coast, but probably throughout the United States. Uh, Faith's uh, was raised in a household uh, dominated by her grandfather, uh, who had ex who was part uh, a high-ranking officer in the czarist uh, 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 military uh, uh, in Russia, who escaped uh, from Russia during the Bolshevik Re Revolution, and eventually came to the United States, uh, where. Uh, he dominated the, the household uh, of faith and he um, believed in living life large, uh, that everything you did was part of a drama. He introduced faith to the Sherlock Holmes series uh, where life uh, was uh, a mystery to be solved. And that was certainly the way faith taught uh, so effectively that 
uh, disease was a mystery uh, to be solved and uh, became really uh, very well known at UC Davis as the best teacher in internal medicine uh, when she uh, followed Hibbert Williams uh, to become a faculty member at UC Davis. So um, th that's the end of the slides I wanted to show. Um, I began to understand that we really, uh, as a, a group, um, many of our classmates did take part in the major historic moments, not only the surrounded our birth, but our education, and then uh, followed us, um, imprinted on us um, ways of living that followed us throughout our lives. Uh, I think in many ways, we are the last of the dinosaurs, the last of the old generation of physicians. And I think this applies to the men as well as the women. Um, we have more probably in common with the way Lucy Lan uh, Wanzer, the first medical student at UCS, than we do with the current medical students. Uh, we were the last group to be really grounded in individualized hands-on medicine. And before mm -hmm. uh, the uh, digitalized corporate medicine arose within um, American uh, medicine. I will always be grateful that I, that I think we were able to enjoy rather the golden age of modern medicine when tremendously important medical discoveries were happening around us, but yet we still were rooted in the old way of being a physician. So thank you, Nancy, for those questions. Well, thank you, Susan. I think we are getting a, getting close to the end. And so we. I think you've answered every question anybody had. So do you have any additional thoughts that you would like to share? I just want to say how grateful I am that you did this book. And I know the hard work I can bear witness. And it was a labor of love. It was intense. And I'm glad you told our story. It means a lot to me. So any uh, additional last minute, you know, I guess we could both say, please, everybody out there, if you're a doctor and you're watching, please touch your patient. You know, in this new day and age, some doctors don't even do that. So that's that's our message. So what do well, you think? One, I guess the last word I would like to say is some of the results of the follow of the 50 year follow up. We sent a questionnaire to everybody. I didn't interview everybody, but everybody did fill out this or um, more than 80% of the women did fill out the questionnaire. And without question, virtually 100% of the women said that they were happy with their profession. They were glad they were physicians, um, that it was the decision to go to medical school was if not the best decision of their life, it was certainly among the best decisions of their lives. Um, I agree. We chose our profession well. Um, and I know that I will forever be grateful to UCSF uh, for the education it, it gave me and will forever be grateful to have been able to ha be, have the honor of being a physician. Amen. <laughs> so I think with that, we conclude the uh, session. And I don't know if Katie is still there. Yes, thank you so much for this. Great, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Doyle and Dr. Detweiler. I love this, your, your long relationship and the friendship you have and the great warmth that you brought to this conversation and to the great work that Dr. Detweiler has done. Um, and uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, just this, um, you know, really interesting conversation about about UCSF, about our alumni, about their history. Um, and, and it is really wonderful to especially be able to have you all reflect on 50 years of your careers 
and then think about our current students who, you know, will will have their own journeys. So thank you all so much. We're going to leave this here. And um, like Dr. Doyle shared, we will be, this is recorded, so we'll be able to share it with anyone who missed out or would like to share it, um, you know, pay it forward and share it to, with others. And we really appreciate everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have a great, great afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye.